Welcome to the Jamie Ivey Show. I'm your host, Jamie, and today my friend Mitchell Johnson talks about what life was like as a 12-year-old when he had to evacuate and relocate after Hurricane Katrina. Mitchell, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So glad to be here. I'm so glad you're here. You know, we were talking earlier and you said everyone remembers where they were when Hurricane Katrina hit. Mm. Um, I have specific things in my life. Uh, like, I remember where I was when Princess Diana was killed. 9-11, um, Columbine, mm -hmm. those type of things. You 100% remember where you were when Hurricane Katrina came into mm. New Orleans in 2005. Uh, you were 12. Yeah. Set the stage for me with what your life looked like in 2005. Yeah, so I was born and raised in New Orleans. Uh, my my entire family that that's what I knew. Um, never went out of the state of Louisiana. Uh, and in 2005, I, I think that was a year right after my mom had gotten out of jail. My parents had been divorced for a little bit. My dad had went ahead and remarried. And um, but but during that time, uh, I chose to live with my mom and my sister had just gone off to try to do college. Mm -hmm. uh, so. So when Hurricane Katrina happened, or uh, when there were calls to evacuate a few days before, my dad uh, ended up taking uh, his side of the family and my sister, and he asked me to go with him and evacuate to like Allen, Texas, where my stepmom's uh, family was at the time. And I chose to stay with my mom. Uh, so I lived- And your mom was not evacuating. Yeah, she was not evacuating. Her, my grandma, uh, and, and we were poor. Um, so uh, for us, it was either, you know, we hunkered down or we're just like driving yeah. to who knows where. Yeah. Um, and maybe we could find a hotel somewhere. But at that time, I mean, if, if you waited two days before Hurricane Katrina happened, it's if, if you're poor, you're not getting out of the city. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, yeah. Yeah. Which so we note stayed. is I think a lot of people don't realize that when they're like, oh, why are these people not leaving? Mm. And some people are like that's so dumb. What are they doing? when the reality is, what would they do? Yeah. There's no money. Yeah. You know, so. It's yeah, in, yeah, yeah, and. So that's where your, that's the boat your family was in. What yeah. are we gonna do? Yeah, we had no idea where we would go. Uh, so we had other family in New Orleans. So what we did was me and my grandma and my mom, we went ahead to the east side of New Orleans where one of my cousins had at least like a two-story apartment so we just kind of hung out there yeah. the entire day uh, when Hurricane Katrina was happening. Um, and it was kind of fun. Like I remember my, my last memory before, uh, I, I, I guess like I went to bed was the MTV Awards okay. and <laughs> listening to Mariah Carey perform uh, We Belong Together. Look at you. And, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, love Mariah Carey, big fan. Uh, and I remember her hitting that last note and it was like a bad note. <laughs> and I went to sleep, all my family was like, what was that? And I remember falling asleep that night. Um, and we wake up the next morning and everything was fine. Uh, and so we go downstairs, we have cereal for breakfast and stuff. And my mom has on the radio and the power's out and everything, but uh, where we're at on the east side, everything's okay. And then I remember slowly like water coming through the door. And I remember seeing it and I told my mom and my grandma and my cousins and I was like, hey, there's like water coming yeah. in here. And my mom was like, boy, shut up. Uh -huh. Like there's not, not, nothing's going on. And I was like, come downstairs. Yeah. Because and it's not raining right now? No, it was not raining. Yeah. This was the day after. So if you think about New Orleans, it's like a bowl. Mm -hmm. um, so where the Lord Ninth Ward is, it's like really below sea level. And levees are, are these things to basically keep out the water. That's mm -hmm. what we built in New Orleans to keep the water from come, going in the into city. the bowl. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so where we were at on the east side, we were a little bit higher in the bowl. We're like, if we would have stayed in the ninth ward, like our entire house yeah. where we actually lived, it was submerged in water. Mm -hmm. Like we- You we, would have you yeah. died. Yeah, yeah, we would have died. Mm -hmm. um, so, so on the east side, it just took a little bit longer for, for the bowl to fill up. Yeah. And eventually uh, what ended up happening, my cousins were so crazy. They were like, take the big screen upstairs, take the big <laughs> screen upstairs. And we're, we're, I'm like, where's the food? Like we need food. Uh, and 
again, I'm 12 at this time, so I'm just worried about my Game Boy. Uh-huh. Uh, and so we, we take the big screen, all these things upstairs, and before we know it, the water is at the ceiling of the first floor. Um, and all of us are upstairs. Because mm. the levees broke, that's what happened, yep. and w- which made all the water come in. So you're mm-hmm. all upstairs, you mm-hmm. and your mom and your grandma and your cousins, and now the first floor is underwater. Yeah. As a 12 year old, are you looking to your mom to keep you safe? Are you scared? Like, what is that feeling that you're having in that moment? Yeah, it was kind of adventure. Yeah. Like at first, uh-huh. um, you know, I say that lightly uh, because this is a huge traumatic experience yeah. for, I mean, this is the second hurricane my mom and grandma has had, had went through. There, mm-hmm. there was a hurricane in like 65 called Hurricane Betsy um, that basically destroyed everything my grandma had. And my mom was like a few years old. So, yeah, for, for me, it was kind of an adventure. Like, I had my Game Boy, it's like batteries yeah. in it. Because you're 12. Um, yeah, I'm 12. Uh, and I had cousins that were way younger than me, and they were just like, what's going on? And we thought that, you know, it might be over mm-hmm. soon. Um, we, and, and so I had no idea about the levees and about, you know, what this meant. Like, I didn't know that it was a natural disaster. Yeah. And, uh, but we just had the radio. Um, and my mom, actually, once once the... Uh, water went up to the ceiling. Uh, she tuned into the radio and we found out the levees broke. And she was like, we're probably going to be here for a long time. And so how long were you guys there for? We were, um, before we were rescued fully uh, and brought to a dry part of Louisiana, it was four days. You were in that top floor? So we were in the top floor for three days. And on the third day, we were rescued by civilians um, who had like a, a small, like uh-huh. kind of like little boat, yeah. like with, with a motor, but the motor wasn't working. So they used two by fours. Okay. It was just people. Helping neighbors. people. Yep. Uh, and so they, so, so they came So in the us. top floor, yeah. you have your big screen. Yeah. Do you have food? Uh, we had like dry noodles. Yeah. Um, man, uh, you know, depending on like the person, uh, first off, you have to be in this place where you understand like, like, if, if you have nothing, if you're already poor and you're seeing that everything's underwater, like we're in survival mode. Mm. Uh, I took swimming lessons from kindergarten to sixth grade at this point. So like I'm the swimmer uh, and me and one of my cousins, uh, there was there was like a gas station, like super close. So me and one of my cousins on the second day uh, swam out to the gas station and door was open. There were Pepsis, waters, like chips, like floating around. Uh, there were some things that didn't hit the water yet, and we got it. And, and we then had to bring swam it in. back. And swam back. Yeah. Um, we, we were the only ones who could swim. So, yeah, that was, that was part of the situation. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you had those swimming lessons. Honestly. Got you some Pepsi God. and some chips ready oh, yeah. to go. Yeah. So, you guys are up on the top floor um, in survival mode. And, you know, I, I really appreciate you bringing to the light that, like, it's the poverty aspect of this is what I think a lot of people don't understand in natural disasters Mm -hmm. is there's two different types of thinking as to what would be happening here. How would you survive? What's going on? And um, I'm thankful for, for reminding us that living in situations of poverty, you can just leave. Mm -hmm. You can't just do what everyone else is like, well, just do what you need to do. So you're up in the second floor. Yeah. You got your Pepsis and your sodas from the gas station Mm because you know how to swim, which I love. People come by in a boat. Yeah. Strangers. Yeah. And say, we're here to get you. Yeah. So, so what had happened was, okay. So think of it this way. The water goes up and down like a tide. Okay. Uh, So at at its highest, it'll go a little bit above the ceiling, kind of creep up the steps. Uh, of the first floor and at sometimes it'll be like halfway okay um so kind of like at my stomach level uh so get this my mom is 411 like she's okay. short uh-huh. short um and so uh you know me like i'm just thinking like hey we need to do whatever we can i'm riding on shirts like out the help. window uh-huh. like help us um so my other cousins like kind of leave and like try to try to figure out like like you know what we can do or Mm -hmm. maybe go to a walmart to see if we could get a boat or something like that uh like a little canoe or something and uh and and so the water goes down uh on this uh second day a little bit and my mom and i go outside and we stand on top of her car 
And I remember my mom going through the water like on her tiptoes because mm. uh, she can't swim. Yeah. But she's just like, hey, we have my grandma who's old upstairs. Uh, we have I have two aunts that were upstairs that were old mm -hmm. as well. And so we were just looking for help. And then these people come by and they say, hey, like we're rescuing people. Mm -hmm. uh, the boat has no motor. It doesn't work. We just found it. And but we got some two by fours and we'll take you over there to the I-10 overpass. Wow. Wow. And so uh, we just kind of was like, yeah, like if you can come um, tomorrow, uh, that would be great. And they were like, yeah, that, that'll be our last, like this will be our last round of taking people over there. That's unbelievable. You know, I, I didn't get to witness that happening with Katrina, uh, but with Hurricane Harvey, I mm -hmm. got to see, we lived in Austin at the time that that happened and hit Houston. And I was able to see just strangers yeah. going and helping and saying, what mm -hmm. can we do? And I know that's a beautiful thing. I wanna talk with you when we get back about that rescue. We'll be back after this break to talk about what happens when the strangers came in the boat to get you guys. Able is an ethical fashion brand that employs and empowers women as a way to end the cycle of poverty. It started with scarves years ago and now it's an entire fashion brand. And I am so grateful that Abel has dressed me from head to toe for this Jamie Ivy show. I would love for you to see all my favorites. Go to jamieivy.com slash Abel to see everything I'm loving at Abel right now. All right, welcome back. I'm still here with Mitchell Johnson, and he was just talking with us about how they had been in the upstairs apartment for two days now, three yeah. days now, and strangers came by with the boat. Yeah. Um, in this point, like I'm, I'm kind of like stranger danger type of person. Mm -hmm. You know, is there any kind of stranger danger when you're stuck in the second floor apartment during a natural disaster? Absolutely not. No, that's Absolutely what I figured. Not. Well, in in New Orleans, if you're, you know, if you're pouring, you live in your neighborhood. Like we have porches. And so I would sit outside with my grandma on the porch and everybody I walked by, they were family to mm -hmm. us. Uh, if, if someone needed a place to stay or if they needed money or something like that, like my grandma would help them. Yeah. And so that's just a mentality that our family had. Um, so even <laughs> when these people came around, we were just like, yeah, we need help. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'd never seen a more unified expression of just like servanthood in New Orleans. Mm until that moment. Um, that was just huge. Yeah. Uh, and, and so they came around, told us that they'll be back for us. And then on the third day, uh, we just piled up into the boat. So we start getting in the boat and they, they're like, okay, kids in the boat first. And so I get in the boat, my younger cousins get in the boat, then okay, the elderly women, mm -hmm. uh, my grandma, my two aunties, they get in the boat. And uh, the boat is at max capacity at this point. And my mom would, would have been next. And she like looks at me uh, and she's like, I can't get on the boat. And I like, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at her and I'm like, no, you're getting on the mm -hmm. boat. Uh, and uh, she's just like, hey, I'm gonna find a way to get over there. I know she can't swim. Uh, I'm like, I don't know the next time. Like, and this is their last round? This is their last round. They're like, hey, like we know like, like somebody's gonna rescue us from the bridge and we know that it's gonna happen this day and we're, this is gonna be our last round. And so I, I, start, I start weeping. Well, yeah. Uh, because I just lost my mom for an entire year. Mm, she was in she jail. she was in jail. Yeah, and I was like, no, like that's why I'm here because I'm, I'm not gonna leave you. And uh, she's just like, I'm, I'm gonna find a way. And so I'm crying. We, uh, you leave your mom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember. I remember them paddling away, and I'm just looking. And you've um, got no cell phone. Got no cell phone. You're going to the I-10 bridge. Yep. Your mom says I'll meet you there. Yep. Whenever. Yep. It's about and and so this I-10 overpass. I mean, it's a bridge at this point because you know water's underneath yeah. it. Um, and it's about half a mile away. Uh, so we can we can see where the apartment is and stuff, and so I was always keeping an eye on it. But but I just remember them rowing away from that apartment, and and I was just weeping, and you know my grandma was holding my hand, uh, and on our way over to the bridge, uh, the boat starts you know getting weird and going crazy, and then everybody in the boat's going crazy. I'm kind of going crazy. I'm the only one who knows how to swim. Uh, and at this point, like that, 
apartment was on a hill. So as we're getting closer to the bridge, like, it's like, I mean, no lie, probably 10, 15 feet, like the depth mm. to the ground. Mm -hmm. um, so everybody's going crazy. The boat's kind of shaking all over the place. Um, and I just remember my grandma, um, she's, she's incredible and she's still alive. She lives in Wichita Falls. And she told everybody, shut the hell up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, she said, grab hands and we're gonna pray. Mm -hmm. um, and I was not a Christian, mm -hmm. had, you know. But your I, grandma was. Yeah, my, gran my grandma is a just solid sold mm -hmm. out Christian. Yeah. And I don't know if it was because, you know, we, we finally calmed down that the boat was like, yeah, uh -huh. uh, that the boat like, you know, leveled out. Um, but, but man, like the Lord really showed up. Um, and honestly, that's where a little bit of faith in me, like kind of, kind of started. started. Yeah. This was like, dang, there's like some power there. So, uh, but yeah, we get, we get to the bridge. There's an older gentleman that like greets us. Um, he's just like sitting. So on the I have a question, yeah. just trying to get my brain around what's happening. Are yeah. there other boats rescuing people? Are there people on this bridge? There's a lot of people I'm, on this bridge I'm at this point. I'm kind of imagining like kind of mass chaos. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it, it's not mass chaos. I, I think it's just because everybody's at the end of the rope. But there's you know? a lot of people who have lost everything yeah. and now they're just on a bridge waiting for, to connect yeah. with their loved ones, yep. to figure out what's next. They've yeah. lost their homes, their cars, everything. Yeah. And so uh, one of my aunties parked her car on the bridge because that's what we yeah, do, you know, if there's a bridge close, yeah. Uh, so there was her car on the bridge. Uh, it was already, you know, busted in, like people had been sleeping in and stuff. But um, so there were other cars parked and um, trying to think of the setting, like people that went to Walmart, got tents, mm -hmm. and they would bring it back for the kids because mosquitoes were crazy. Yeah, I mean, this is this is August. Yeah, if you, if people don't know, it's yeah. hot. Yeah, in especially New in the swamp. Yeah, yeah, in the rain. Yes. Yep. And, yeah, and and so it was just humid. It was so bad. It was so bad. And we're we've had these same clothes on for three days, um, and, and so yeah, it, it a few hours passed by, and you know, I'm just like I'm just kind of like sad. Yeah, because my mom's not there. Yeah, and I'm like, if we get rescued you know, what's gonna happen. We, a helicopter comes on this day and, you know, we thought that they were gonna rescue us, but instead they dropped down like water and mm -hmm. food, like these mm -hmm. kind of like little army packages yeah. where mm -hmm. you add water and it heats up. Yeah. And I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah. They had like a Salisbury steak or something like that. <laughs> nice. Like cardboard. Yeah, but, there you go. Um, and, and so there were some things that happened like that. And I was like, what if a helicopter comes and takes us and my mom's not there? And uh, so I'm just chilling in my auntie's car and you know, next thing I knew, uh, there's a speedboat with a fan on the back, one mm -hmm. of those. And there's this kind of old, bigger, like white dude, like like driving it and just, and my mom is in the back just chilling. Like not with my other cousins, but like, it's just By her. herself? Uh -huh. Yeah, it was just her. And like, it's like, it was just so weird. I was like, this is kind of out of a cartoon. Right. And she said she would come and she, this guy uh -huh. just is, Bringing, bringing her to the bridge. Yeah. And she walks up and she's like, I told you I would come. How did that happen? I have no idea to this day. But she showed up. She showed up yeah. in this yeah. guy with this with this crazy boat, just oh that gosh. you would regularly see yeah. in a swamp with a fan on the back. So as you're 12, you mentioned something earlier that I think is interesting, is that you had said like when you got in that boat to leave your mom, um, how traumatic that was for you because you had just spent a year without her. Yeah. And I'm wondering if even in your 12 year old brain, you, when you spend a year without your mom, it's because she left you. Like she had to go to jail for whatever mm -hmm. circumstances. And this point, even though you're 12 and it's not really your decision and your mom made you do this, you're the one leaving your mom. Mm -hmm. Was there a little something that stuck around with you even growing up, becoming a man of those moments of saying, my mom left me, I left my mom. Like how have you dealt with that as a grown up now? Yeah, uh, when, when we eventually moved to Texas, we struggled a lot. Um, and it was always my decision to stay with my mom. I could have gone with my dad. I could have even, you know, there was some time where we didn't live with my grandma. And I could have, my grandma even told me to mm. come live with her. And you her, always but, chose your mom. Yeah. I knew that my mom and my grandma always had to be strong for the rest of our family in hard times, but they never really had someone to be strong for them. Yeah. And so, without any man in my mom's life. Like I just felt like I needed to kind of 
put myself in that mm-hmm. position mm-hmm. and in some ways protector, you know, like, you know, as a 12 year old kid, I'm like, man, I'm, I'm mm-hmm. strong. I can yeah. help you. Yeah. Uh, I can be there for you. And that translated to like, you know, my decisions in high school, um, loved football, loved all of these different things. But uh, there was a, there was some point where I had to just get a job and start taking care of myself. So my mom wouldn't have that burden on herself. Mm-hmm. Um, and as she was learning how to live life and recover, like learn how to do things like finance. I mean, we've been evicted from so many apartments. I've mm-hmm. seen cars taken away from her. Um, it kind of forced me to grow up, yeah. uh, but it also taught me just, you know, how to like, how to be with someone who's like just recovering or mm-hmm. struggling yeah. um, and how to care for them yeah. and, and love them well. So there's a lot of things my mom has taught me, like compassion um, and, uh, but yeah, I, I think that those are kind of the it's, ways that, I don't know, those, those experiences impacted me. It's looking back and I can see how as a young boy, you had to make some really hard choices. And, um, you know, as being a mom to teenagers, sometimes I'm like, oh, I don't know that they're equipped to make those choices, but you just do what you have to do when you have to do them. And it's like mm-hmm. God was also preparing you to be this man in your mom's life for so many yeah. times. Um, when we come back, we're gonna talk about what life looked like after Mitchell and his family left New Orleans. We've been married for almost two decades, and most of what we thought about marriage before getting married turned out to be wrong. It's better than we thought. But it's harder than we thought. We love deeper than we ever thought possible. And we have to work harder than we ever thought we would have to. And so we wanna help you fight for your marriage and believe in it more than you even think it's possible. We wrote this book, Compliment, for all of you. Those of you that are engaged with Marriage on the Horizon, we believe this book has something for you. Those of you in the early years of marriage, still trying to figure things out, there's something in here for you too. Or maybe like us, you've got a few years of marriage under your belt, but maybe things seem a bit stale in your marriage and friendship. We hope that this book will be a catalyst to remind you of the beauty available to you within marriage. So we wanna be super clear, we are not experts on marriage and we don't have a perfect one but we do believe in it and we believe in your marriage. Compliment is two books in one written by both of us. I wrote a section. And I wrote a section. We each wrote on the same 10 topics, things like loving, fighting, forgiving, sex, parenting, and mission. And we didn't even read each other's sections beforehand and together our two parts make up one book. Compliment is full of stories and encouragement about how to choose together over separate in marriage, how to bring out the best in the other person, complimenting each other day after day, year after year. And we truly believe that when you do that, that God is glorified and that your marriage becomes stronger and more unified, more like how God intended it to be. Okay, guys, we're back. Mitchell Johnson is still here. And Mitchell, how did you get from the I-10 bridge to Wichita Falls? Uh, so we spent the night on the I-10 bridge. In your auntie's car? In auntie's car. Uh-huh. Um, and, you know, they, they there were people who brought tents from Walmart. With your cardboard Salisbury steak. Yeah, cardboard, <laughs> eating, just eating good, as good as I can, um, or as good as I could for that. And we spent the night there. Um, so I'm super sad about that. The guy who actually greeted us on the bridge mm-hmm actually passed away later that day. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Was he sick? Um, honestly, we think it was the heat. Oh man. And that, so, I'm sure that was very common with yeah. elderly people yeah. in having to be outside in New Orleans at that time. Yeah, there were mm. about 1,800 people, I think, who, who died yeah. during Hurricane Katrina and half of them were. were after. Yeah, yeah, well, half of them were elderly. Mm. Uh, and so during that night, you know, we put him in a bag and prayed over him and, you know, like, just like dumped him off the bridge, uh, which was like, okay, ending, ending the first night on the bridge, I'm just like, what is happening? It's a lot to take in. Yeah. And so I'm with my mom, uh, going into the next morning, helicopters start coming and, uh, helicopters come and they basically take us off the bridge and bring us to some dry part of Louisiana. Okay. When we go to this dry part of Louisiana, there's like, 
hundreds of people just like in lines waiting to get on these Greyhound buses. We get on the Greyhound bus. Um, the rest of our cousins actually found us at that point. And I'm just like, wow, this is incredible. Uh, true sign of God, honestly. And then we get on this Greyhound. With nothing. With nothing. Nothing. Literally nothing. Um, I have my Game Boy, it's dead at this point. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and they take us to Houston and everybody was asleep on this, on this Greyhound bus. Uh, because it has AC, mm -hmm. we have water, and uh, so we go to Houston, go to Astrodome. Uh, at the Astrodome, uh, my grandma, you know, her generation remembers all the numbers. So she got numbers for even distant relatives mm -hmm. that we had in Wichita Falls, Texas. Phone numbers, yeah, got it. Phone numbers, yeah. And I remember my, my dad's number, my sister's number. Um, and so uh, once we get to Houston, uh, they feed us like, you know, small pizzas and stuff like that. And we're on cots and stuff in the Astrodome. Yeah. It was insane. And uh, I get a hold of my sister and my dad who were at this point, they're watching tel the because television. Because they evacuated early. They evacuated mm -hmm. early. And my grandma contacts our family in Wichita Falls. Uh, so she calls those relatives. Um, and basically we go to Wichita Falls and we get this apartment and it's fully furnished. People knew that I was from who, like the chur churches or something, yeah, like who? like churches and just like so many just awesome wow. people came together and uh, they knew I was a twelve year old kid, so they gave me like all these clothes, like a, a varsity like running back like gave me their Letterman jacket, so like I would have a jacket and it was just sweet things like that. And you're starting what grade? Uh, I'm in seventh grade. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's just funny, quick story, but. Uh, I needed shot records to get go to school. Go to school. Yeah, and they don't and play around with that. They don't play around. Mm -hmm. And so I'm the I'm the planner. Like I have anxiety even as a 12 year old. So I I try to take all our important documents with us. And my mom's like, you we don't need it. And so <sighs> I still put it in the car, but she takes it out. <laughs> and they have my shot records. We could have had my shot records. Right. And so state of Texas made me take every shot over again. So. We'll see uh, how long I live. <laughs> because um, you've been vaccinated twice with everything. Basically. It's okay. You're so, here. You're here. Yeah. You're here. So you start school. You're in this new place. Mm -hmm. I mean, jobs, you, mm -hmm. you, people have given you clothes. Mm -hmm. How did you guys survive the next year? Yeah. Uh, it was a lot of adjustment. Um, it took my mom a bit to get a job uh, just because of uh, her being in jail. Like, Criminal record. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It was just really hard for her to get a job at the beginning. Uh, and the first year was really to get us on our feet yeah. um, and to establish a new normal. So uh, for me, it was just learning. Like I, I realized my accent and me talking really fast was really hard for my teachers. Uh -huh. uh, so I kind of even had to adjust the ways that I talk. Like I don't have an accent for most of the things I say. There's some things my friends will point out. Uh -huh. um, but uh, I had to kind of adjust that yeah. and I had to kind of learn what it would it look like to be out of school with majority white people instead mm -hmm. of majority black people. So that was a huge adjustment. That was a huge adjustment as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this 15 years ago, mm -hmm. Hurricane Katrina, when your life pretty much changed. I mean, pre-Katrina, post-Katrina, yeah. New Orleans, Wichita Falls, all the things. When you look back on the past 15 years of your life and you walk through something super difficult at 12, and I imagine there were even more difficult things growing up mm -hmm. um, in your home until you left for college. How do you think all of that created the man that Mitchell Johnson is today? What did mm. that contribute to who you are? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing that it contributed, especially growing up the way that I did, um, I don't, first off, it saved me from a lot of bad decisions in like high school and- Getting out up. of where you were living? Uh, no, I think honestly, just the situation that we were in. Okay. I mean, we were already, we already had so much going on uh, and it was so hard just growing up the way that we did. Uh, it forced me to not do things gotcha. like party mm -hmm. and to kind of be smart and mm -hmm. to make smart decisions about who I hung out with and what I did um, and getting a job and stuff like that. But um, man, so, so I look back and I see that the Lord protected me mm -hmm. in a lot of ways doing that. Um, but also, uh, man, it really gave me an, understanding of what it means to 
uh, have joy? Mm. And like, what do I need to actually have that joy? Does it need to be the latest things, mm -hmm. like the latest clothing or like a new car or, you know, all, all of those things? Or is it just, man, just being present mm -hmm. with the people that like God has placed around you yeah. and just yeah. being grateful for life? Mm -hmm. um, and that's what my grandma and my mom both taught me, especially in those really hard, dark times. Because I can't imagine how difficult that was for your grandma and mom to not only lose everything they had and for your yeah. grandma that had happened before and your mom, relocate, taking care of a 12 year old and the fact that they taught you to still have joy in the midst of having mm -hmm. nothing. I think that is something that will be lifelong. It's yeah. what you will carry with you uh, forever and ever. And yeah. how is your relationship with your mom today? Oh, it's so great. Um, my mom is, I mean, I've been through so many hard things with my mom. Um, and so we have a lot of positive and negative experiences together, but man, she's just, I mean, she's just a rock. Yeah. Um, and no matter you know what she's walked through, whether it's been her fault or things that have been against her, like she's like persevered mm -hmm. through it. Um, and same with my grandma. Uh, so I really look up to them. They're my heroes. I love that. I love mm -hmm. that those are your heroes. Mitchell, thank you so much uh, for yeah. sharing your story and talking about it. You guys, the thing that I think about most when I hear Mitchell tell his story is that maybe you haven't been through Hurricane Katrina. I've never been through a hurricane and had to reevacuate, but we've all ha had to relocate after evacuation. We've all went through hard stuff. Mm -hmm. We've all walked through trials. And so I love that you have this joy that cannot be taken away in the midst of the trials. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Mitchell. Thanks. Okay, you're still here. We already finished the show, but you're still here. And I'm so glad you're here because I need to tell you something. Make sure you subscribe so you never miss an episode. While you're at it, like it. And then while you're at it, tell your friends. We have so many good shows coming up. So come on, subscribe, do all the things.